Welcome to the IdeaCast interview series, episode number 91. My guest in this episode is Deepa Rajan, and Deepa is a PhD candidate in the Tetrad program at the University of California, San Francisco. And in this conversation, we discuss her current research project or projects, and um, she investigates how unicellular organisms called Stentus aurelius are capable of learning despite having no brain or nervous system. So if this sounds familiar to some of you, uh, the work is perhaps akin to what uh, Dr. Mike Levin is doing in the Levin Lab at Tufts University and with a collaborator, Josh Bongard. So uh, there are similarities there, and that's one of the reasons I uh, was attracted to Deepa's work, and so we will explore that in the conversation. In the beginning, we talk about her work in biology, and then I settle in with a more of an uh, armchair philosophy conversation with her, and I appreciate her uh, willingness to do that because there's uh, definitely a line between doing good science and then uh, talking about the science afterwards. So I very much appreciated having her as a, as a guest, and she will be back if she can uh, fit me in and for a second interview sometime down the road. So please enjoy. Thank you. So I'd like to welcome Deepa Rajan to the IdeaCast interview series. My timeline for having met Deepa, arranged an interview, and here we are was one of is like my record for the like shortest amount of time in uh preparing and and meeting and setting up a a pre-meet so uh i just i say that because um when i found your work i was like oh this is so exciting and i would really love to have this person on my show so deepa uh it's a privilege to have you on this show and uh as you can tell i'm <laughs> kind of amped to have you here and talk about what you can share with us so welcome Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely going to be a, a, a great conversation to the YouTube audience. Um, I know you're going to, my subscribership is is uh, philosophy of mind oriented, and um, this is going to be right up your alley. We're going to be talking about intelligence and uh, and I'll save the rest for, for the unfoldment. So um, in in the spirit of traditional interviews, I would kind of like to go ahead and um, have both myself and the audience find out a little bit about you and from an academic background where you're coming from and then we'll go right into your work and and talk about what you're doing right now that sounds great so i grew up in austin texas and i went to college and did my undergrad at vanderbilt university in nashville tennessee and there i majored in neuroscience and got a minor in violin performance and Vanderbilt is where I really fell in love with the brain. I was working with amazing mentors in the labs of Jerry Rook and Jeffrey Kahn, and I was working on developing a drug for a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. And the brain is just this marvelously, marvelously complex organ. And to me at the time, it seemed like perhaps the most complex thing in the universe. Um, but what initially attracted me to science as a child was actually insects, bugs, the creepy crawlies in my backyard. And so I had this firsthand look at intelligence that is in not in invertebrate species beyond mammalian brains. And so as I progressed through my undergrad, I felt this um, like desire to study intelligence beyond the mammalian brain. And I felt that the brain might not be the fundamental unit of intelligence. The neuron might not be the fundamental unit of intelligence. So after I graduated from Vanderbilt, I wanted to merge my interest in neuroscience with my original love for ecology, the environments and biodiversity. So I applied for a Fulbright fellowship to go to India because India is one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. And I fortunately got the fellowship and I got the opportunity to work with Shannon Olson in NCBS National Center for Biological Sciences in India. And there I was working on studying the brains of pollinators and I fulfilled a dream of doing a bunch of field work. I got to go to the various Shola forests, the Himalayas, looking at how 
insects behave in the wild and in the lab. Mm -hmm. And since I had the fortune of looking at a whole slew of creatures, I was privy to their intelligence. And I got to asking the question, how did this all begin? I mean, I see, I mean, India is a wonderful place. There, there's cobras on the ground floors of the dormitory sometimes. <laughs> and there are wild plants, so much to see. And um, how did this all start and what connects them? And so then I came to UCSF and that's where I am right now um, in San Francisco. And I'm an MD PhD student. And I was very curious about the, the origins of intelligence. And so now I am a PhD student in the labs of Wallace Marshall and um, my co-PI is Adam Frost. And I get the fortune of working on this beautiful charismatic stentor, which is my Zoom background behind me. And it's a single cell that's capable of learning. And for me, this is a window to begin to peel back that question, where did this all begin, the origins of intelligence? That's, uh, for, for like in nerd world, that's just so incredible what you were doing uh, in your research and your travels and all of this. And I say nerd with you know, love in my heart because I'm kind of a plant nerd myself. So what you, yeah, that's just amazing. And we are going to find out uh, I didn't know it. I, all I knew about Stentor prior to meeting you was the uh, Resilii, uh, I think that Jennings did. And we had talked about that. There's, And I'll have the link down below for the audience. There was a Harvard Medical School, had, uh, their YouTube channel had a, uh, updating on Jennings' work. And so that's that's kind of what I knew. And so uh, now that I've met you and Stentor Serralius, and we're going to talk about that um, for the, at least the first third of maybe half of our conversation, um, it really speaks to my my quest, my curiosity, as you mentioned, what is intelligence and what's what do bio things, organisms, uh, you know, yeah, I can't even ask the question. It's <laughs> you could probably do a better job, but it's like, you know, what's going on? Maybe that's the best thing to start with. Um, and now I want to go on a tangent real quick. You, you minored in violin. When you were in uni at, uh, oh my goodness. So so what, uh, if there was a genre or type of music that you were studying corresponding to the violin? Uh, yeah, I, I love classical music. I was classically trained and that's mainly what I was playing in Vanderbilt. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so was it like romantic or was it more modern or or, or Baroque or where were you with the, uh... <laughs> sorry for the tangent, but. I, no, I love this. Uh, my, my favorite era is the romantic era. Okay. Um, and bleeding into the the beginning of the 20th century. I okay. love Prokofiev is one of my favorite composers. Okay. Glazunov, Shostakovich. Yeah. Um, oh, I love it. wonderful. And, like my first foray into neuroscience actually was through music because mm -hmm. when I was in middle school, I started playing music in nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And the, these people had, a lot of them had Alzheimer's disease. And so that was my first window into how different types of music can affect their cognition, affect their moods. And so that's how I ended up studying Alzheimer's disease in college and mm -hmm. learning about neuroscience. As you said before we hit record, everything is connected. So um, so thanks. I appreciate that because uh, it just happenstantially I was watching. Uh, in fact, I was lining up an interview with a person who uses philosophy as a kind of business coaching thing and he's uh, into sort of pre-socratic philosophy and he loves music so we we're sending each other stuff back and forth and i sent him vivaldi's uh la stravaganza number two and for me there's the largo and the second allegro and it's just like you know complete i probably mentioned this in the pre-meet maybe i don't know if we talked about it i get confused but just the vi it's all strings the the vivaldi piece is all strings it's either violins or or cellos or whatever so anyway, thank you for the tangent, <laughs> allowing me to go on that tangent. That's so awesome. Um, and I and I and I confess I don't know too much about that transition into sort of 20th century modern or neoclassical uh, composition. I hear it on the radio sometimes, but I'm more stuck in that sort of late Baroque, early Romantic uh, with Vivaldi and Haydn and things like yeah. that. So, I mean, yeah. I mean that's a fantastic era in itself. Right now, oh. I'm at San Francisco Civic Orchestra and. Ooh. A strings ensemble so there's because it's a string ensemble we play mostly baroque pieces or also some oh. classical mozart okay. but something so satisfying about um well i was practicing bach in my room and it felt like the auditory version of burning incense like there's mm. something so satisfying about all of the harmonies and chords coming together in a very algorithmic way mm. and 
sort of I don't know some order from the chaos that's how I feel about baroque music in general Bach in particular okay all right yeah maybe they were tapped into something and when you said uh sort of an audio incense I've been uh jamming on Daniel Tammet lately and he's uh um he's a high functioning um I'd say he's more in the Asperger spectrum but he he can take pi out like 50 35,000 places or something like that and it's all pictogrammic it's almost uh images and shapes that correspond to the numbers and he says um, um, reciting Pi is like is like poetry to him. So his mind, and this is something we can segue back. You know, I'll I'll pin that for a little bit because I do want to talk. We want to talk about intelligence and you know just what just how we're scratching the surface of it and the hubris of thinking we know so much. But uh, but yeah, Tamit's an interesting study um, in that. So uh, so yeah, again, thank you for indulging me in that tangent because I think again it corresponds to uh, sort of the bigger picture of what we will be addressing uh, in our conversation especially when we get more into the metaphysical implications. Uh, but first, before we do that, before we move into philosophy, let's mm -hmm. talk about um, Stentor Rosilius and did I, Cerilius. I'm sorry, Cerilius. I'm getting dyslexic. <laughs> Cerilius, I'm getting dys dyslexic on you. Uh, and the work you're doing and some and some of the um, findings that you're getting from that. And, and so if you want to set up um, the Mind Without a Brain, which I thought was a really nice, uh, provocative title. And I'll have the link for that down below for the YouTube audience. So so, so share your research with us and, and we'll talk about that for a while, please. Yeah, sounds great. So my research focuses on a central question, which is how can a single cell learn without a brain? And the cell in question is Stentor Cerulius behind me once again. And so learning... I define as an adaptive updating of system processing in response to new information. And there are many types of learning, but the type of learning that I'm focusing on with my experiments is habituation. And habituation is a gradual decrease in response after repeated stimulation. So for example, when you put your clothes on in the morning, you probably notice how they feel, but over the course of the day, you likely learn to ignore them. And that's a form of habituation. But the cool thing is you have 86 billion neurons to help you with this feat of learning, but I'm interested in how even a single cell without that network connectivity can achieve the same type of habituation. So <clears throat> to study this in the lab, we have this habituation device um, that can basically tap the cells and provide them a stimulus. So when the stentor cerulius gets a tap, they contract from this elongated shape, and you can see they're in this trumpet shape behind me, they contract from this elongated shape to a ball-like shape, and like a roly-poly does, and this is an escape mechanism from predators. But when they get repeatedly tapped, they learn to ignore it, and then they remain in this elongated form. And this is relevant for them in, in an ecological uh, environmental context. So we can find stentor in freshwater ponds, and we sometimes collect them locally from ponds in Golden Gate Park here in San Francisco. And the ponds can be a dangerous and chaotic place. I mean, there are lots of predators in the pond. And so it makes sense that when a predator tries to nibble on the stentor, the stentor contracts into a ball. But the pond also has ripples always or mm -hmm. almost always and so if the stentor is contracting to every single ripple that's a waste of energy um so when the stentor learns to ignore weak force stimuli akin to ripples but still can contract to strong force stimuli and i'm trying to figure out how this happens on a short term time scale and a long term time scale mm -hmm. um so um i guess like in terms of short term memory and long term memory that we think about in humans or other animals so um what i found so far is well at least on the short term time scale i try to train several cells at once so i mentioned we have this habituation device in the lab we have a dish of cells and we have many cells in this dish and then this device is automated through an Arduino, and we can specify the force and frequency of the taps to this dish of cells. So that's basically stimuli, uh, stimulus after stimulus. And basically from those studies, we found that um, each cell undergoes this single stark switch from this unlearned state in which the cell is 
always contracting to a learned state in which they remain extended. And this switch happens at a different time for each different cell in the dish, sort of like a eureka moment for each cell. So um, rather than having a gradual learning for every cell, it was cool to see that there's just a sudden switch in which it goes from being naive to being trained. And just like kids in a classroom, they all learn at a different pace. Mm -hmm. So um, that's at the short time scale. And then at longer term time scales, so the more you train them, the more they retain this habituated state, the more that they remain extended. Um, and I've been doing drug treatments to, to find out what are the actual molecules involved in both the short and long term time scales. And I think you noted that in your in the um, publication that I was reading about the um, I have to check my notes here because I want to make sure I say the words right. The mechanical sensitive sensitive ion channels uh, were giving that indication the communication uh, within the stentor for that reaction. Is that what you were just in, just saying just now, or am I jumping ahead of things here? So so yeah, that's how we think it's happening that okay. there is mechanical mechanosensitive ion channel that is responding to a force and that leads to the contraction. Okay, okay. And one question I had, um, so you had a two, it was like a, a two state uh, model in your experiment that you were doing, mm -hmm. uh, but you acknowledged, I think, in, and we referenced Jennings work earlier that um, does uh, the Ceruleus and Roselii, uh, does Res Ceruleus have other modes of like there's contraction. Um, and I think you said in Jennings work that there was a reversal of the cilial uh, m movement and then on there was oh swaying perhaps like swaying. Does mm -hmm. uh, the Ceruleus have that other means and, and you just selected for the, you were observing just the contraction behavior, um, but is there potential to also include in the future um, these other methods of action that the um, uh, Ceruleus has for defending itself? I don't know if that's... There's definitely, yes, uh, okay. um, there's definitely potential for that. And Daniel Cortez at Virginia Tech is is studying that right now. Okay. Uh, the Right now, I've just been focusing on the contraction because it's just okay. very visually tractable, but mm -hmm. there's probably far more complexity than we've ever seen before. And I do see instances where for a high force tap, the, the cell immediately detaches without contracting. And that could be another form of that multi-step hierarchy of avoidance response that that Jennings saw in Roselia. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was curious about that because I because again you noted that about Jennings' work, uh, but I wasn't sure if if uh, Cerulius was capable of that. Now another question I had um, was um, you talk about the hold fast that Cerulius has, um, but I also noticed there seemed to be motility as well, like they can uh, move themselves from A to B. Um, in your work. Uh, did it matter if they were in a in a holdfast position, if they were anchored to something, if they were in sort of a mobility mode or motility mode, would, would the would that change what you were observing in terms of learned behavior and so forth? Did it affect that at all? That's a great question. Yes. So okay. for my assays, I needed the cells to be anchored to the bottom of the dish because they can still contract when they're swimming, but it requires a different amount of force. Okay. So just to keep everything consistent, I wanted them to be anchored to the bottom of the dish. And I did that by coating the dish with a sticky adhesive substance called polyornithine. And that helps mm. the cell just, just stick there. Okay, to anchor themselves. <laughs> I, I noticed um, also, I think you said that, that short-term memory, I, did you clock it in at, at about five hours for there? And then when you, you when you tested again, that they sort of had an, a loss of that learned, uh, the habitual, uh, habitualization, uh, was, was that the threshold was about five hours for their ability to uh, remember um, the uh, perturbations or whatever the, the, the um, ruler was doing when it was tapping the, uh, the mm -hmm. dish? So it really depends on the length of initial training. So if okay. I train them for an hour at a frequency of one tap per minute, then they'll usually remember for about maybe five to 15 minutes. So, so oh, not a okay. long time. Um, and when it also depends on the speed of training. So I've done experiments that are akin to cramming for an exam. So mm. when I cram for an exam, 
I try to stuff in as much information as possible, but then I also usually forget it right after the exam. And the same thing happens for Stentor. So I tried giving them one tap per around per second or per 1.2 seconds. And they learned really quickly in just a couple of minutes, but they also forgot within 30 seconds. So oh, okay. it really depends on the, the force and frequency of the stimuli and how long that stimuli is being delivered. Okay. So, so if we were to think along those lines, if you were to um, apply the, the tapping stimulus at slower intervals, uh, that, that would correspondingly uh, lengthen that short-term retention or, or the, you know, quote unquote, short-term versus long-term retention of that behavior, that habitualization, habitualization <laughs> with, with, does that correspond or, or, or is the drop-off or the, or the unlearning, um, not, it, it's not as significantly different, uh, from the like 30 seconds that you were mentioning. No, it, in general, it does correspond that okay. when I use the interval in between stimuli, the, length of retention increases, but I haven't actually done a very systematic, like, okay, I'm going to give it every 30 seconds and every one second and every one minute, five minutes. Um, I've only just done a, a couple of different intervals and I'm not quite sure if there's a maximum intertrial wait period, meaning okay. like if I give a stimulus one minute and then wait 20 minutes and give another stimulus, would that make a difference or has there been too much time in between for the memory to be consolidated? I'm not quite sure. But what is interesting is I found recently that spaced repetition is something that improves memory retention in Stentor. And this is something that uh, we use a lot in medical school. So I, I was a medical student for a couple of years and a lot of medical students use this flashcard program called Anki and it's a spaced repetition algorithm. So you are presented with a set number of flashcards and then um, you wait a little bit and then you're pr presented with the same set of flashcards with special emphasis on the ones that you got wrong the first time. So I was wondering, does the same thing apply for Stentor? And so I would give them a bout of training and then a break period, and then the same bout of training and another break period, so on and so forth. And with those break periods interspersed, um, they actually retained more and more each time. And not yeah. only that, um, the steepness of the learning curve increased. So they're learning faster each time as well. Mm. I'm leading up to a, a bigger question, and which is where we're going to start getting into uh, more metaphysical um, speculation. And that is, uh, you talk about in, um, I think it was your your uh, talk that you delivered on UCTV about, um, I think I want to say that's where it was, and you were grafting, and you were doing the anterior, you were taking the anterior, no, the posterior section, and um, training with that. And it led me to wonder that whether it's through division conjugation or or the grafting process that if um that retention of the memory or the habitualization can be observed in the daughter generation or the um one of the two segments that are, are divided and recover I, I think i can't remember you said that you mentioned the recovery time and it seemed fairly quickly for them to sort of reconstruct themselves back to being full stenters again so can you speak to the potential perhaps for um you know generational filial uh transference of this kind of learned behavior do you think there's any potential for that or are they just too simple for something like that to happen or or do we just not know yet <laughs> am i asking too big a question no i don't think it's too simple or too big a question i okay. so very recently i managed to capture a dividing cell while um oh. during a training experiment okay. so uh, it's sometimes hard to time these things because they divide every three to five days and it's hard to know exactly when it's going to happen. But just by lucky accident, it happened to be dividing while I was training the cell and the both of the new cells maintained the learning of the original cell. So, I mean, it's a very low end. So all of this is preliminary, but yeah. I, that was very exciting for me to see. And I'm hoping to get more examples of that to, to see how it generalizes to the population. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I know, speaking of happy accidents, that you had mentioned in your talk that um, you had inadvertently left a population. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that? And and it doesn't relate to what we were just talking about, but I also think it's interesting for people who are here for Stentor, Stentor fans, you know, <laughs> that that you can talk about what, what you observed uh, when they were neglected. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, Many of the fascinating, uh, many of the things I that fascinate me about Stentor are related to how their memory is stored and the ways in which it can be transferred. So that's one reason why I'm interested in Stentor division, like I just talked about, because each new cell is taking a part of the cytoplasm with it. And when a cell is learning, um, it's likely that there's some locus of information in that cytoplasm, the, the jelly-like substance inside the cell. Um, and another instance when cytoplasm is exchanged is during mating. And so they mate via conjugation and there's an exchange of cytoplasm. And it's been difficult in the field to reproducibly induce mating in a culture of stentor. Until I had an accident on September 7th of last year, and I remember the date because it was very striking to me, and I put this jar of stentor under the microscope, and then I saw hundreds of mating cells. And I had not seen this before. And this was the jar of cells that I had accidentally not fed for a couple of weeks. And so I tried to retrace my, my steps. How did I actually end up with this jar of mating cells? And then I, I managed to reproduce it a few times that it's a combination of starvation and high density of cells that produce the conditions to make this culture mate or ma many cells in the culture mate. And that was exciting to me because um, I'm interested in memory transfer. When mm -hmm. can cells exchange memory when they're mating because they're exchanging cytoplasm? How does that work? So um, I try to train mating cells and they can learn while they're mating. So they they can, basically they contract in synchrony together and they can habituate together as well. But it's really hard to know um, exactly if a memory transfer is occurring because the methods we have now are to induce mating in an entire population of cells, but not to induce mating in a single pair of stentor. So a better, more, um, precise way of doing that would be a grafting experiment where you where you take one cell and physically stick it on another cell and, and have them exchange cytoplasm. And that was something that uh, Vance Tarter did many, many decades ago. Um, but we are still, it's a difficult technique. So, so we haven't actually done it with these cells yet. It's hard to maintain survivability sometimes with these micro manipulations. Gotcha. Forgive me, I'm writing a note down because <laughs> I have ideas popping in my head in real time and I'm like, oh, wait, <laughs> so I'm amending my notes there, sorry. Um, so to to what we've just discussed, when they are uh, in conjugation or even just simple division, um, what's the genetic profile in these guys? Are they fairly genetically diverse or, um, and does that genetic information, is, are they in a kind of, um, what do I remember from botany, uh, sort of a stable breeding? Are the um, uh, homozygous kind of expressions coming out? Uh, what What's their profile look like um, as these sort of animacules that they are? Yeah, we um, there's a postdoc in Wallace's lab, Ashley Albright, who is doing a lot of um, genetics and omics work on these. So stay tuned for, for her oh. discussions. But um, <laughs> The, the stentor has a macronucleus, so if you look at a microscopic image of it, it has this beautiful necklace-like organelle that looks like beads on a string, and that's okay. the macronucleus, and that contains the genetic in information, and it's uh, polyploid, so it has many, many copies of okay. the genome, and um, we're not quite sure why it, it's um, so polyploid, but it could have to do with containing the information required for cellular regeneration. So one other cool thing about stentor is when you cut it in half within eight to nine hours, it will be two new functioning cells. And so as long as the fragment of the stentor that is cut off contains a piece of that macronucleus, that's those are the instructions to construct an entire new cell. 
So okay. it could have something, some evolutionary purpose for that to make sure that the cell survives even when it's fragmented into many pieces. But there's still so much left to discover about um, the genetics of, of this creature. Okay. Now this may horrify the Stenter fans out there, but has anybody worked with uh, like mild mutagenics to, to see if they can um, scramble up some of that polyploidy and get varied expression? I mean, is that some, is that even worth doing or is it just, you know, treacherous and mean? <laughs> I would think of that, but <laughs> has anybody worked with that kind of thing? We already torture them so much that I... <laughs> you're you, you don't go to culture scene or anything weird like that to try to scramble their eggs a little too much. <laughs> oh well, we do use culture scene. Oh um, okay. For, well, I mean, for for different purposes to. Oh, to mess oh okay, but not as a direct mind. mutagenic or yeah. Okay. Um, but there there are other things. I mean, the dream would be to use CRISPR. Um, oh yeah, to yeah that's true. See if we can really change things in a precise way. We don't have CRISPR developed yet for these cells, but we do have RNAi, um, which is a way of knocking down different genes. So mm. we can we can do RNAi by feeding. So we can have E. coli that expresses a gene of interest that we want to knock down in stentor. Um, and then we can feed the stentor these E. coli and then the, the the RNA that they ingest will will bind to that RNA of interest and cause a decrease in expression. Mm -hmm. So that's those are the tools we use to like mess with the genes so far. Okay, okay. Now to speak to your background, there's the rosette formation. Do you want to speak to that a little bit about um, this type of behavior that they sort of collectively um, get together and and what's going on when they do that? Yeah, well, first I have to say one of my favorite parts about working with Stenter is that, um, yes, people have done outstanding work on it so far and discovered so much, but still it's a non-model organism and there's so much unknown. And rosette formation is something that still has a lot of open questions. Uh, there is a paper that came out recently about how in rosettes, um, so for example, the cells behind me are in a rosette formation, they are built to optimize feeding flows. So basically the stentor have cilia on their oral apparatus, the, their top part, and they are filter feeders. So by beating the cilia, they can ingest whatever algae or other ciliates are in the water around them and just take them inside their, their into the food vacuoles. But um, there are some slow feeders and some fast feeders. Mm -hmm. And so in a rosette, some slow feeders will position themselves next to fast feeders to mooch off of their feeding flows because the fast feeders will be bringing in more food and then the slow feeder can benefit off of that. Mm -hmm. But then there's a lot of switching around that happens. So if a fast feeder suddenly slows down, then the slow feeder moocher will go find another fast feeder. So, so there will be like some exchange in the rosette. Okay. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure how the rosettes form. Um, one, I've, I've been trying a series of experiments lately and all this is preliminary, but I've been treating the cells with cyclohexamide, which inhibits protein oh. synthesis. Oh, wow. And when I found, when, when I give, gave them this drug treatment, I found that it inhibits this aggregation. I didn't see any rosettes forming. So it could be that there's some sort of peptide that is synthesized that's used as a signaling molecule to help these Stenter come together. Okay. Um, totally speculative, but it there could be some sort of communication happening in forming these rosettes. Okay. And that speaks to a kind of um, default altruism, doesn't it? I mean, that, that this might be one way of, um, if we want to use adaptation or survival as a, as a um, cue here, that, that maybe this is a good strategy for them to, uh, or, or do you think there's something else going on when they aggregate like that in population or in rosettes? Um, I mean, it, it definitely seems to me an example of collective behavior. They're okay. benefiting off of one another. Um, and then when one cell in a rosette contracts, it may influence the contraction behavior of the neighboring cells because it might set off a fluid oh, wave yeah. against the, the neighboring cell. So okay. it could maybe be advantageous in a pond setting because one cell could be the canary in the coal mine in terms of alarming the other cells about a predator coming. So it's advantageous in that sense. Um, I wouldn't jump to say that 
center are an altruistic species in general. I mm -hmm. I just don't know enough about it <clears throat> because they also cannibalize each other sometimes. Mm. And um, it's not clear exactly what instigates this cannibalism, but um, that, I don't know. Uh, any species will do what it takes to survive. And sometimes it's forming rosettes. Sometimes it's eating the neighbor. Yeah. And so I would ask for a little charity when I say altruism, because it's more that it's it's like a, we were talking in our pre meet like the cellular coherence of a liver, you know, where you have to be a good liver cell and and otherwise, you know, the whole system gets wonky. But so so that's kind of the, the version of or the uh, context of of altruism. Mm -hmm. It's not that they're yeah, it's <laughs> peace and love and yeah, they're very Zen like <laughs> stentors. Speaking of um of cooperation, I noticed and I can't remember the species name, but it was a sort of universal uh, species. Uh, named across you know all the different kingdoms and stuff um that had a symbiotic relationship with a particular type i think a, a particular algae and i don't even remember the algae but um that they that that once in the stentor the algae would um give uh whatever it was energy of some kind i don't know if it's carbohydrates to the stentor and this and then it would feed from the waste of the stentor and it seemed like they had a little st does uh Cerulius do that at all you see that exhibiting in that exhibited in that at all um, not that we've seen okay. so far, um, okay. but it is, I, I think it's really cool when, uh, was it Center Piriformis that you were? It may have been Piriformis. It was one of those species names that you see everywhere. You know, it's in plants, it's in animals, but, um, and I can, I can catch up with you on that at some point, but yeah, I just went and just, it was probably on Wikipedia. In fact, I was looking at different stentors, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's like, what is there, 16 species or something like that? I can't remember, but like, yeah. You named species so far. Yeah. How many? I think around 22, but oh, 22. More, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, good. And, and you're going to find some too, right? <laughs> get, get, get the honor. So this past summer, I was at Woods Hole, Massachusetts and um, had a lot of wonderful con conversations with Daniel Cortez. Um, I mentioned that he's also looking at the hierarchy of avoidance responses in Ceruleus. And so he was at um, Woods Hole at the Marine Biology Lab. And uh, he found a couple of new species of stentor that we're now working on. So mm. one of them might have this, this uh, a facultative endosymbiont. So an algae that lives in it and that affects its behavior. Again, totally preliminary. We don't know this for sure, but it seems like the diet that we feed it, the type of algae we feed it affects its ability or um, like motivation to swim towards light or not. So, so, I mean, there's so much, left to discover with oh i'm sure right such a tiny little thing yeah <laughs> it's not like it's a huge tree that you can sit and st stands out really salient you know <laughs> which leads me to a question um uh, and uh are there range maps are there are there um atlases uh that define where you'd find the in situ populations like the naturally occurring populations of these various species or is has that not been uh, are they so ubiquitous or cosmopolitan that it's it would be impossible to try to map them and where they reside i wish there was a map that okay. would make um I love things maps. So much easier <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean we tried to record the gps coordinates coordinates of where we've ever found them before so for example in golden gate park we have a specific site where we like to go and take samples and okay. um it's always good to get the vegetation in the collection tube because the, so instead of just scooping up the water, take the plant with it, because sometimes wow. the stem here are attached and anchored to the plant and then filter feeding from there. Um, so we have some GPS coordinates from Golden Gate Park and also around the Marine Biology Lab in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Uh, a lot of research has gone on there and there are certain lakes and a swamp even that have been regular sites of collecting stentor. And a lot of Stentor research has mainly occurred in the West. So um, okay. I guess there's some German stentor researchers back in the 1800s, 1900s, and a lot of sampling has occurred sort of in the Western hemisphere and maybe in the um, North as well. So I think there's still so much left to explore in terms mm. of other places. So whenever I travel somewhere, I always try to travel with a flask so that I can yeah. take samples from whatever local um, ecosystems, streams there might be. I was recently at the Winter Quantitative Biology Conference, not recently, I guess it was in February, but I was in Puerto Rico oh. and it was really cool to go to the El Yunque rainforest and oh, okay. sample from there. 
And I didn't actually find stentor, but I found a species that my lab mate was looking for, Euplodes. So yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to many more trips and travels and carrying a flask and collecting yeah. <laughs> Which leads me to a thought that uh, for the citizen scientists out there that may discover this conversation, um, that yeah, uh, extraction or, or collection and, and then checking in on what might be residing in your local uh, ponds. For me, it's canals. I live in Florida. So you've got me thinking out loud. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I should, I would need like a 10 foot collecting pole because we have gators here. <laughs> so you can't just go up to the edge of a pond. You'll become dinner. <laughs> so it's just, I'll just get a like nice long collecting <laughs> a pipe that, you know, I'm just siphon it up. But yeah, you got me thinking. I'm like, oh, because whenever I, my job takes me out literally into the field all the time, because I do, I work for the uh, Department of Agriculture and we're doing bugs and diseases and stuff all the time. And it's like, there's so much stuff out there in the field, you know, it's either invasive things or it's the the native stuff, but I disregard what's in the water itself other than the odd, uh, there's a lot of fish out in those canals, but now I'm thinking stentors. <laughs> no, I think it's thing. great for citizen science. I'm, I'm yeah. sure there's so many species of stentor that are undiscovered. And mm. I think it's a very, it's just even if no new species are discovered, which I highly doubt, it's just fun to look at water from where you live and mm -hmm. see how much life is in a drop of pond water. Yeah. And stentor are quite large. And I think people can learn pretty quickly how to identify different members of the genus because they have they usually have a distinctive shape. They're either trumpet shape or bell shape, some sort of curvature. And there are books to help identify. So if anyone is out there watching, I mean, I, it's so much fun to to just go into a local pond and see if you can find some stentor. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm inspired. <laughs> As if plants weren't enough, I'm going to go out and look for stentors too. It's I mean, you might get two for one. Like you collect yeah. the plants from the water and the stentor hanging off of them. <laughs> I'm going to. I'm that obsessive because we. I I live by um, voucher maps for my area, and so they for the state of Florida, every county. They, they voucher things and there's sometimes there's a, a void and there's no voucher for this particular county and I'm in about four or five counties and I'm like oh, opportunity I could be, you know get voucher credit or get it to somebody I know who could get the voucher I'm not it's like not big for that I have my name on anything but just getting somebody else to get the voucher it who's working somewhere else in this uh, you know forestry or horticulture or agriculture or whatever so it's like a little uh, what would it be like a um, scavenger hunt kind of a thing yeah so trying to id things so uh let's see let me reel myself back in i have a couple more questions and then i would like to go off into the uh philosophical implications um so in uh um cilia fora is that the phylum that we we're talking about before we hit record is that that these are that the um stentors are in are there other uh genera that could give you some more insights um into what what you've done with uh, stentor are there other critters uh again in that uh, i think it's the cilia for a um phylum that, that that you've thought about imagined possibly being able to yield information for you and a la the uh, avian's response kind of thing yes for sure and even beyond that i i would be so bold as to say i think every single cell in in oh. every genus is has some form of intelligence how it expresses its intelligence is a different story but there's so many like even bacteria um even prokaryotes are capable of chemotaxis they can migrate towards uh some sort of food source or away from a noxious stimulus um there are other ciliates like vorticella um, that can contract so that's another way to study a similar type of habituation um, there are also, I mean, yeah, there, there's so many other ciliates that are amenable to this. The reason we chose stentor is because, well, one reason is they're, they're large. They're the size of a period at the end of a sentence. You can mm -hmm. even see it with your naked eye. And so that makes it very easy to see this extension versus contraction. And so it's, we can measure it well, and then we can quantify it. And so it's just a feasible system to work with, but by no means the only system ciliate or just cell in general that is capable of learning okay that makes sense i think you even mentioned in um might have been your uctv that uh, you were like white blood cells as a good example of what can we 
hack the coding and and train perhaps and i'm using again the, the word give me charity on train but you know get them uh response uh loops or whatever going on with that um i had I, okay so i have one more question uh and thank you for indulging a sort of general audience guy like myself with the sciencey questions I, I wanted to honor your work by having at least some, you know, some reasonable questions for you so the last thing i would ask is um are there in in the in can you enrich your data with other um uh stimuli like the like the um measuring stick or the uh, what do you call it the ruler that's tapping the 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 fluid um are there other means of uh triggering or instigating abiance or avoidance behavior that you've thought about that might again come in from a different perspective or is it is it pretty much solid with what you're doing with the uh disturbance by way of the tapping is there are there other means of agitating these things to these no, guys? The, there are other means. And okay. so center can respond to light as well, for example. Okay. So in response to flashes of bright light, they contract. Okay. They have negative phototaxis, so they swim away from anchor away from bright light. Okay. Um, and maybe this is because there are more this is a speculation, but perhaps there are more predators at the surface level of a pond or something, or maybe the pond cover pr provides protection from light. For whatever reason, the center, these the specific the, the specific center species have um, evolved to have negative phototaxis, but other center species actually go towards light. So um, it's another basically behavioral stimulus that we can tune to check on learning. Okay. And center also respond to electrical stimuli. And what all of these tools give us is an opportunity to study multimodal learning, which is something that I'm interested in. So basically, uh, in other animals or even in humans, there's evidence to suggest that when, when auditory stimuli, for example, is combined with visual stimuli or even olfactory stimuli, that learning is faster and more significantly retained than if it's just a unimodal stimulus, if it's okay. just stimulus, for example. So okay. I don't know if this is true of stentor as well, but perhaps if I could combine the light stimulus with the tapping stimulus, maybe the, the learning would go faster than if it's just one stimulus alone. And moreover, another exciting thing is associative learning. And this is the, the Pavlov's dog experiment okay. that um, can, can the stentor associate one stimulus with, with another. Mm -hmm. And this can be done by, by pairing these different types of stimuli like light and tapping, for example. Um, all of this to say that, I mean, well, well, two general things. One, I think we've just scratched the surface with the types of learning that center can do. I've only, I've mainly worked on habituation, but that's not to say that they're capable, they're not capable of associative learning as well. And associative learning is something that's usually been associated with um, higher order animals like dogs. But um, cells might be able to do that as well. And then also, I think the general exciting sentiment is how conserved is are these different types of learning across the tree of life? Because I've mentioned in a lot of my experiments that I've described that part of the inspiration is what are animals capable of? What are humans capable of? For example, the whole cramming for the exam, exam uh, experiment. Mm -hmm. um, it's true for me, it's true for other humans, is it true for Stentor? So I think that any answer is interesting. There are two possibilities. One, Stentor, well, maybe more than two possibilities. One, Stentor learns using um, similar mechanisms, similar molecules, and similar behaviors as animals, including humans. The other possibility is that they are doing something completely different which is also exciting, like a totally novel form of, of learning. Mm -hmm. And then I guess another possibility is they're, they're just doing a combination of things, some things that are similar, some things that are not. But it's just uncharted waters, and it's exciting for me to just see what are these creatures capable of and how similar or dissimilar to us are they. So many, <laughs> so many questions and implications that we could consider and, and 
I, I thought of one question that might be a good bridge. And we were I was joking with you about it earlier, how I just stumbled upon that word encestation and how amoebas, the, 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 when you Google encestation, they'll talk about um, parasitic um, uh, little critters that live in the digestive system and they have to have this layer to protect themselves from hostile environment. And so in, 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 in cestation is basically building a cyst around a single cell that protects it. In thinking about that, we could take that sort of sterile um, Darwinian perspective that this is just trial and error, it's repetition, it's you know, billions and billions and billions of lived uh, experiences that you know the survivors will insist themselves and and encase themselves for protection um but i also wonder if that artifact is not also in in uh co-creative relation or however you would frame that um with a kind of proto intelligence that uh can respond a lot faster than you know hundreds of thousands millions of years whatever it is of that you know trial and error, the fumbling uh, that we see in some instances when we talk about sort of Darwinian adaptation. What do you think about um, not only trial and error, not only things dying because they, you know, the fittedness that they talk about, but also in simple forms like amoebas and stentors and things like that, that it's really more of a relational thing with uh, sort of, again, a proto-intelligence and the uh, interaction with the environment and and what the environment does uh, to um, call out things that are not capable of of adaptation. Does that does that question make sense? And does it does it speak to uh, what we might be talking about here? That um, that this very basic intelligence uh, is in relation with its environment to again create artifacts going forward in generation after generation. Hopefully that question was coherent. I think I understand, but correct me if I'm veering off a different path when I'm answering, but I think that all life is intelligent because mm -hmm. a cell requires intelligence to um, replicate and survive mm -hmm. and therefore evolve. So, and when I talk about intelligence, I know it's a, it's a loaded term that some people don't like, and and when I use to characterize cells, I'm basically meaning um, computation of various degrees of complexity. And every single living thing is capable of complex computation. And there's a reason, well, because complex computation is required in order to navigate the challenges of the environment to survive and reproduce. So for that reason, I feel like in, I always think about intelligence and computation within this evolutionary context because, um, I mean, that that is how every creature makes it through its life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, d does that sort of get at it? It does. It, it's, it's right in line with what I'm asking. And so my question, the basis is a little bit cynical, and I may be strawmanning certain um, Darwinian arguments for how evolution and adaptation uh, moves through time. And so I'm, I'm, I'm probably... I may be mis misrepresenting uh, because, you know, of course, Darwin interpret Darwinist interpretations on a spectrum. But I'm I'm also wondering, like, so so one interpretation of adaptation that I get, and this is my folksy intuition on it, is that you know things live and die by their ability to adapt to an environment or or a situation um, outside of them, and so that could be seen as just genes passing on for those that survive. They, they put that fittedness into their genes, you know, and again, whether it's a complex or a simple uh, specimen a creature, uh, you know, again, I'm maybe getting lost in the question there, but just asking about two things going on at once that, you know, things live and die by their relation to the environment and something puts pressure on that species or, or um, group of, uh, system living systems, and also that the intelligence inherent within that you just described is responding in real time versus genetic passage, uh, uh, genetic tra transfer, uh, you know, in, in genes that are responding to. So in other words, I guess maybe I'm saying genes and intelligence and in simple creatures, is it more a case of intelligence rather than genetic adaptation to the stresses of the environment? <clears throat> Hopefully, hopefully I didn't muddy things any any more than I had on the question. And we can drop it if, if it's if it's... Know, like, I mean, I 
I'm not sure if I if I totally understand the question, but I I mean there are instances of learning and memory being passed down through the generations. And mm -hmm. there's been work done in C. elegans, the worm, about um inheritance of learned information. And I mentioned before the the division of Centaur, the the two, at least in the very like minimal examples that I have. The, the two new cells retain the learned information of the, the original mm -hmm, cell. Mm -hmm. So it, it could be some sort of Lamarckian alternative to um, the, the usual Darwinian evolution uh, in terms of fast tracking. There might be some sort of environmental pressure that leads to an epigenetic change that is then passed down. But I think we have very limited knowledge of that, um, especially when it comes to Stentor. So I, I wouldn't make any conclusions about it. Okay. And again, we're moving more into the speculative part of the conversation. And so, but it was just kind of a random thought that popped up. And it's like, after listening to what you've said and what you've learned from Stentor, and then my, uh, you know, one phase of understanding Darwinian adaptation and evolution, where they're like, oh, it's all the genes and, you know, that, that which survives passes on the code for, uh, you know, do it just slightly differently in this way. So that way the environmental pressures, you don't succumb to them as easily. And I'm also wondering if, okay, yeah, genes, but also the, the inherent intelligence that, uh, responds more quickly or more rapidly to what's going on in the environment. So yeah, it's a, I'm sorry, it's a real muddy question. And, 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 and I don't, you know, want to hold you to an answer per se, but if you just wanted to, uh, you know, throw out uh, again, speculation about that, but, but you did, you answered, you answered perfectly fine again, given <laughs> how I delivered the question. And I apologize. I just, <laughs> I would add that is slightly tangential is I do think about evolution, the process of adaptation and evolution <laughs> in general as a form of population level intelligence, mm. because I, I mentioned my definition of learning at the beginning, which is I would define learning as an adaptive updating of system processing in response to new information. And this can occur at the level of a single organism. Like for example, a stentor is repeatedly getting mechanical stimulation, repeatedly getting taps, and then uh, updating its system processing when it figures out that these taps are harmless. So it doesn't have to contract all the time. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing with environmental pressures, um, like the, the whole peppered moth example that I just remember from high school biology that an entire species, the if you think of this the species, the population as a system, then it's updating that system processing based on whatever new information it gets. And that new information is an environmental challenge. Mm -hmm. And that challenge is is like really changing the nature of the population itself because it's killing off parts of, you can even think of it as neuronal pruning or something it's like getting rid of the things that are not able not beneficial for navigating that challenge and the things that re remain are now this updated system with new information that's a beautiful answer that that really sums up where i was it, it's it's satisfying where i was coming from with the question so thank you you got me off the hook on that one because like I said, I know it was a muddy question and I'm like, uh, I wish I could articulate it better. But again, I'm just kind of an average guy. And and so but like I said, I I, I know in listening to certain people who are married or wedded rather to uh, particular Darwinian model perspectives that that, you know, it's all very hard and fast about genetics and you know killing off, dying off. But but, you know, what you said was very elegant and that it is it is a kind of pruning of sorts that that leads to. Uh, a greater, a, a, a more sustainable expression or more viable expression of what is going on. Um, so I, I know we probably want to, because uh, people watching this who uh, are interested in intelligence and mindedness uh, will bring uh, something that Michael Levin talks about, which is technical approach to mind everywhere is, is tame that he has. And so maybe we could set that as the theme for getting into more philosophical perspective of what what your work might imply, what Michael Levin's work might imply, because I know there's probably people out in the audience going, oh my gosh, this, you know, why aren't they talking about Michael Levin? <laughs> and I wanted to wait, you know, because you have your work and it's uh, distinct, but also in the same ballpark as what they're doing over there with their planaria and their xenobots and all those weird things. Um, so in acknowledging technical approach to mind everywhere, I know one thing you wanted to cover when we move more into a philosophical uh, discussion was uh, the mind 
body dualism that's been batted around for what 250 odd years or, or since the Cartesian split kind of thing or, or the thinking of Descartes. Uh, so mm -hmm. would you like to open up with that and and, uh, and 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 share what you're thinking about that what might not be a problem <laughs> that that seems to have been plaguing a lot of thinkers? Sure. I just think that Stenter are a fantastic system for many reasons, but one in particular, it seems to address this issue of dualism mm -hmm. because dualism as the idea that mind and body are separate entities, but in the case of Stenter, a single cell, the mind is the body um, residing potentially in the same cytoplasm. So, I mean, for me, the appeal of biology is, I, I love talking about philosophy and biology gives me the tools to actually address some of these philosophical questions in an empirical way. So when talking about dualism, I feel like Stenter is a system to give armchair philosophers a seat at the lab bench and mm -hmm. address this duality. Okay. False dichotomy. Yeah, yeah, it's like a false dichotomy. Um, so, so let's open that up more and share and again, to everybody watching and to us, this is this is just us thinking out loud. And, um, you know, we're not committing you to anything. But yet, this is where the, the beauty of the imagination can can lead to novel <laughs> perspectives and thinking and so forth. Uh, so, you know, again, going back to Levin, for, Dr. Levin for a minute, um, you know, he talks about a scale invariant swarm intelligence. And so and and language can be tricky here uh when it comes to intelligence and problem solving and um updating of priors and things like that what do we want to ascribe that to do we are we keeping it within biosystems for this conversation or, or uh you know do, do you think that intelligence is some sort of inherent thing or, or non-thing in the universe, or, or where would you start with process, processes of intelligence? And I know you've already defined intelligence, so I might be able to answer the question based on what you've said, but maybe just to pull this out of you to, you know, go go out and, again, just using the imagination, like, where, where what do you think's going on? Let me put it that way. What do I think is going on? Well, to answer your first question, I don't think it's limited to biology, okay. because, I mean, I think Computers are intelligent too. They're silicon-based intelligences. Yeah. Um, it's just a form of knowing something and mm -hmm. how that information gets encoded can be through some carbon method or in a carbon-based life form or in a silicon-based non-life form. Um, I, I think it's intelligence is more general than biology. Okay. Yeah, cybernetics is a crude way of kind of, you know, bridging uh bio carbon based and then the, and and then the silicon things that we create with intelligence that at the very least are emulating intelligence or or you know sort of mirroring intelligence back to us by behavior and by adaptation and now with um machine learning it seems that they can on their own uh sort of learn and uh update uh, mm -hmm. in, in that sense and 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 again to invoke uh, Dr. Levin, he he goes way out there with uh, chimeric uh, silico carbon um, uh, chimeras or hybrids or whatever his terminology is, where where we may see a future, uh, perhaps in your lifetime. <laughs> You're younger than me, so I may not make it, but you know, sometime in the in the not too distant future, where we see these these hybridized uh, intelligences and. And uh, but, you know, again, for me, I look at the the ontology or the underlyingness of what's going on in a naturalistic sense in, a, in, in what nature is doing. And so could we then bracket intelligence? Um, so so let me let me rephrase this. I would look at at, our, at what we're calling artificial intelligence or, or, or the um, silica based intelligence uh, systems as being something that was created by us that is essentially, again, just either mimicking or mirroring or um, feeding back to us our own intelligence, like an extended mind kind of proposition where, uh, you know, a calculator 
is an extension that will do calculations for us or even a notepad is something that we write down our thoughts in and we can recall the memory from that. Uh, but, you know, and again, a big, big, deep philosophical question, does it, does it not matter? Is it just intelligence? Does it matter if we're orchestrating it and replicating it through um, silicon systems? You know, is it just this, again, universality of intelligence that doesn't matter the substrate, the medium, or the interaction, that it is just intelligence? Would you say that that's safe or, or fair to say um, that? Um, well, can I ask you a question? How, yeah. how would you define intelligence? At problem solving across multiple, um, not domains, but, you know, it's it's complex problem solving or even simple problem solving by an agential uh system and and so in that i would say intelligence is is a uh a method of action maybe uh expressed by x you know mm -hmm. um yeah i i think that method of action is broad enough. I mean, I tend to have very broad ideas of, of these concepts. I'm just thinking about the different scenarios of the origins of life and how, I mean, I like NASA's definition of life as a self-sustaining chem chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Mm -hmm. And But why does it have to be a chemical system? Well, I guess, I mean, anything can be a chemical system, but there are instances of perhaps sand dunes being considered life forms because uh -huh. it can replicate. And I'm not quite sure if they can undergo Darwinian evolution in the same way that carbon-based life forms can, but there are other systems on earth that can be seen to replicate in that way. Or there is a um, clay world hypothesis a while back that clay was the first self-replicating material um, because they're forming templates that then become reproduced and subsequently evolving. So in terms of, um, because there are so many different avenues for the possible origins of life, that makes me think there are also many different avenues for the emergence and expression of intelligence. So I, I too think that there's a very broad expression of intelligence in, in the universe, perhaps. And I'm not, I'm sure other people know this way better than me, but I'm not quite sure why we, like the universe has taken off in carbon-based life forms. I'm not sure exactly what is so special about carbon, but maybe it's just something that, like some sort of statistical um, well that we fell into. But I mean, if it fell, it was a different well, then perhaps the, the intelligence can go in a different direction as well. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And <clears throat> this leads to something I before we hit record that I that I wanted to bring to the fore. And that is that how do we even recognize or define intelligence? I mean, we did define intelligence as it is satisfactory for what we're talking about. But in a bigger, much broader, as you said, you're zooming the lens out um, universally, like thinking of the cosmos itself. Um, who are we to not think that animacy? And the patterns and regularities of what we call physics is, and, and, and I'm not imposing any kind of watchmaker universe kind of nonsense. I, I'm sticking strictly with, with a very naturalistic framework here. I'm not trying to go in that direction. But just to say that if we, if we take the really big view that, you know, what we're doing as these tiny little things on a tiny little planet in an unremarkable solar system uh, is, is part and parcel of what the universe itself is doing. It's just we are on maybe a different time space scale or we're on a different type of scale or a different type of uh, mode of behavior or whatever it is. But yeah, I, when like you mentioned with sand and clay and so forth and the animacy and the interactions and relationality uh, all the way down to perhaps a molecular level, it's like, well, who are we to define? I, I get you, you mentioned in our pre-meet about anthropocentrism and we shall not impose it upon that which is scientifically sacred, yada, yada. But nonetheless, we can't escape seeing ourselves as a model for what is, you know, ph phenomenologically very naturally occurring. Like we're not an anomaly, I don't think. So if mm -hmm. that helps to lend to the conjecture that, you know, intelligence can express itself in ways that we may not have access to. I mean, we have a limited access to the electromagnetic spectrum, our sense organs. Uh, what I, 
the one thing I love to cite is the information theorists talk about the, 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 the sense organs in this system that is Justin taken 10 million bits of information per second, yet I am only given granted access to 40 to 120 of those bits. So, you know, it's like, that's just, and that could be a metaphor, but it really speaks to the idea that, that this lens of the screen of perception or the lens of perception is extremely limited. And the hubristic, you know, carryings on of human beings to say, well, you know, we've got all this kind of thing sorted out and, you know, we are the apex and all this kind of stuff. And, and we are for our system that we occupy. So I'll hand it back to you because I'm on a, on a tangent here, but that's something I, that, that, that when I think about an, uh, big eye intelligence that you know what is it and who are we and and are we just a particular aspect or mode of the functionality of intelligence or the um the again the ontological uh nature of intelligence so I'll, I'll pass that back to you and see what you think sure i i definitely don't think that we are the apex of intelligence because i i think sometimes how we how we evaluate intelligence is just based on what is similar to us, which is not the best metric. There are other forms of intelligence, especially in the realm of communication that really inspire awe in me when I look at other creatures, especially ants or mm -hmm. insects. And um, a lot of intelligence has to do, for me, intelligence is very grounded in the processing of information and the computation required to process information. And processing information is also related to communication. And so in communication, there's there's a signal and there's a receiver. And I think about um, when I was working with Shannon Olson in India, it was a chemical ecology lab. And I learned that a male moth can smell a female moth from 11 kilometers away mm -hmm. and just make a bee line or a moth line just straight <laughs> to the female moth. Yeah. And that's something like if, if we were to smell the female moth pheromone, we probably, it would just be lost on us because we don't have the, the receiver for that. Um, or even cockroach pheromones. It's, there are so many signals out there that um, I think meaning only comes from when, when the receiver is, has adapted um, in conjunction with the signal. And so there's there's a useful meaning that arises from that processing of information. So so yes, when I look at ants communicating and how they're or even bees with their pheromone communication, but also their dance communication, they the bees have a waggle dance to depict the location and distance of the food source. That's incredible. And to do that um, in like coordinating so many different creatures in a single hive or in a single ants ant mound. Um, I'm amazed. So again, th so that just addresses that. I, I think there are many different forms to have this complex processing of information that I would term as intelligence. And then to speak to the other thing you said, I, I think about the universe as fractals sometimes. And one of the draws of studying Stenter for me is it makes me feel humble. Like I, I think of myself as, okay, I'm a person, I'm Deepa. But actually when I wake up every morning, there might be like a billion little Deepas inside me, like as like all these little cells with their own minds. Yeah. And so I'm just this, um, like one, so I don't know if you've ever read this book as I, as a kid, there is this book called Wayside Stories from West Side School um by louis sacker i i'm hoping i hope i get the name right but it was a silly kids book that i read and one of the stories there was this kid who came to school each day and he was he had this trench coat um like all zipped all the way up so no one could see his face and so he'd come to school every day but then with each day he started to smell worse and worse and first, no one said anything, but then the smell got so bad that the teacher said, you have to take off your trench coat. What's going on? And then the kid unzipped his trench coat and it turns out it's he's a bunch of rats like they're like he was not a child at all. It was a bunch of rats disguised as a child in a trench coat. Oh, wow. And I that might be me that might be you like in terms of like the I'm I'm the kid in the trench coat but instead of a bunch of rats I'm a bunch of cells with their own independent minds independent I mean they act collectively but mm -hmm. I think of computation as a series of Russian nesting dolls yeah um, that, like there's a different 
um, layer of computation as you open each doll. And, and that's what inspires me about Stenter, knowing that, yes, I think of myself as a single entity most times, but actually I'm composed of so many other intelligent beings. And I think that the scales can can go the other way as well. Like I, if I was a stentor, then and you are a stentor too, then m maybe they're Russian nesting dolls all the way up as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. Um, it's hard for me to conceptualize what the the big Russian nesting doll encasing everything is, or if there even is one. Mm -hmm. But um, that's how I think about intelligence as one nested within the other and interconnected. That's very, uh, that visually that's very poetic and it <clears throat> it's a good uh, hur heuristic maybe, a, a, you know, a means for us to understand. And you you referenced stigmergy and I, I have always fascinated by murmuration and stigmergy in, in social species and look at ourselves as being social spe species, yet we are metacognitive, which to me hampers or stifles the ability to be truly uh, somewhat stigmergic, you know, efficiently stigmer stigmergic um, in that our egocentrism or whatever it is, our sense of individualness uh, can, can ha and now I'm going off on another, you know, bizarre tangent, and I don't want to get too much into social things, but it's like, I almost want to say that that instinctual animals have an advantage over us because we're we're looking at um, our evolutionary story or adaptation story. We've reached this point where, you know, we do have personalities, we do have um, capabilities to reflect and to predict uh, and to model things, and also to suffer far more greatly than any other creature can. Um, you know, we are capable of suicidal ideation, whereas most animals don't think about their mortality and things like that so it's almost uh in game theory they call it the molex deal where you, you know where it's a cost benefit analysis and sometimes i really think that those that are instinctual uh and work in these kind of um, stigmergic patterns or cooperative patterns much like our bodies do you know our bodies as you as you pointed out with the rat uh, allegory that um all the systems of cells these nested intelligences at the various organs and structures of our body have to work, as I said earlier, altruistically in a, in a default sense. Like there is no option. Like it's that or cancer, or it's that or an autoimmune condition or death. <laughs> so sorry, sorry to get kind of Debbie Downer, but it's just like I, I almost think like when we think about adaptation strategies, it's like we kind of tripped over our feet, maybe. And and I'll and I want you to respond to that if you don't, if you're interested. Uh, because like I said, I think self-reflective thinking and metacognitive thinking uh, is deeply advantageous, is deeply um, important for technological advancement or, or whatever it is um, that's, that's positive valence or good. But at the same time, there's a huge cost in that as well. And so maybe do you want to address that? Like when we ramp up to our being social creatures and, mm -hmm. and uh, what can the, the deep burden of responsibility that comes for that and maybe the need uh, without imposing any kind of morality or deontological prescriptions uh, that, you know, we we have this tremendous cognitive power, at this other type of intelligence um, at our disposal. Mm -hmm. And and what does that say about intelligence and that cognitive horsepower not being guided by, if you want to call it wisdom or discretion or whatever. So I'll stop there and, and see how that mm -hmm. lands with you. Uh, first, a question for you. So by stigma G, are you referring to the like the ant example or the bee example I was talking about? Yeah. And again, I ask for charity. It's it's more of a metaphor when I speak to us as having stigmergic qualities, perhaps, or just, you know, it's a metaphor at this point. But yeah, like ants use this sort of decentralized intelligence through pheromones, pheromonal mm -hmm. communication. Murmuration's different. It's more uh, birds have such an incredible reaction time because of scale and stuff like that. So fish and birds, it's a different thing. But yeah, stigma G through pher pheromonal communication. OK. Um, well, first, I, I disagree with some of the things that you said in terms of mm -hmm. humans being the only ones to um, have a conception of mortality or to experience pain, things like that, because I I just I think it's hard for us to know that for sure. I mean, okay. anyone who's had a pet and I admit I, I don't have pets, but anyone who's had a pet, I think, would say that their dog, for example, has experienced pain before or experiences um 
yearning when their owner goes away and yeah. happiness when their owner comes back. So I think other animals are are capable of that as well. And then also uh, stentor can respond to opioids and um, they make them less, morphine makes stentor less contractile. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what this means. I mean, it's very exciting for me to do different drug treatments. I didn't do this opioid experiment, but it's exciting for me to do different drug treatments for stentor because it shows me um, if the responses of these cells are similar to human responses, perhaps the stentor cell has a similar receptor or a similar protein, similar mechanism to what is true in other animals. So there might be something conserved. So that that being said, I perhaps stentor can experience pain as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and in terms of animals that have sort of funeral rituals mm -hmm. for their their dead kind, even ants. Like, I mean, I don't know if it's a, a funeral ritual sort of bleeds in with, you want to get the diseased parasites of the dead one away from the colony. But yeah. um, there is a death pheromone for ants, oleic acid yeah. that will, they'll get coated with and then move to the death pile. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just hard to ascertain that. I, I just doubt that humans are the only ones with, um, those properties. And we're unique in that we're on our own species. In terms of whether it puts us at a disadvantage for having metacognition and this sort of wisdom as opposed to a more dispersed intelligence, um, I don't know. I, I think about advantages and disadvantages as always relative to what are the environmental challenges. And perhaps we evolved as we evolved a very advanced prefrontal cortex so that we can plan for the future because we're a very technological species. We use a lot of tools and we have, we need to plan things and maybe our need for planning has shaped our introspection, reflection and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, I know the jury's still out on the role of human pheromones, but it would be so crazy to me if there weren't human pheromones. I mean, we definitely respond to the smells of other people. And um, one thing, I mean, this is a side note, after living in India for a bit and coming to the U.S., it just smells different. Like, I mean, I feel like the U.S. is very sterile compared to a lot of um, tropical areas and maybe to our disadvantage because we can't really smell the other people and the other creatures around us. So I think that maybe it also it is also culturally dependent um how we interact with each other i mean in the us it is mainly an individual society individualistic society but in more communal community oriented societies especially when when i moved from india to san francisco and one of the biggest changes i noticed was how we interact with neighbors that in India, everyone will just introduce themselves, even if they're complete strangers. Whereas in San Francisco, um, neighbors hardly ever talk to each other. So I, I think that a lot of this um, diffusive external intelligence might take the form of senses other than smell. I mean, there are many ways to have dispersed intelligence through um, auditory exchanges, visual exchanges. And I think a lot of that is culturally dependent. No, I completely agree. And I apologize for misrepresenting the idea of animal sentience in the sense uh, I would just, and um, going back to Dr. Levin, he talks about a cognitive light cone so that the social animals, wolves, elephants, or others that would mourn the loss of another or um, have you know, social structure that I would argue, and this is not out of hubris, that our light cone, I can think of, I can wax sentimentally about a grandparent and think, you know, about something 40 years ago. Whereas I would say, is it likely that what I would, again, had called instinctual creatures uh, would have that capability of thinking of two generations back and, and the fond memories of that great grandparent or grandparent or whatever it was, or thinking forward, uh, you know, obviously the instinct to protect the young and the offspring is there. 
but just imagining that that you know second generation out and what were their quality of life be? so it was more of a nuanced uh, mm -hmm. projection in that sense um so again i, I did not mean to discredit the, <laughs> the uh, faculties and the affect uh, uh potential for any living creature yeah i completely agree so so apologies to you for for um, not being more nuanced in that statement but again i i, I just speak to what i see as a, a kind of a gulf uh between us and and perhaps whatever percent of, of living creatures on this planet um, that we, in other words, we have to, I just think we have to tread carefully given the, the um, dynamic cognitive um, horsepower that we have, you know, if that makes sense, like that, that we, as again, planning creatures and um, with our cognitive light cone and our ability to think forward uh, and plan for a future, it can be altruistic or it could be um, misanthropic, you know, or misbiotic or whatever that term might be where we, you know, we, you know, we plan terrible nefarious things uh, uh, because of, um, you know, the ability to uh, isolate ourselves as seeing there being some value scale of importance or whatever it is that that causes negative, uh, what we would call ne perhaps negative behavior. And that's a judgment call there on my part. But, you know, I mean, we see evidence of that. There's wars, there's corrupt governments, there's people who seize power, mostly weak men that seize power, you know, and and feel substantial because of it. So so anyway, I, again, I'm editorializing, but I, I speak to a larger thing that, you know, again, when we talk about intelligence um, and our situation and, and our e example of ourselves, um, that you know, there are a lot of. I think there are a lot of caveats that should be installed in our thinking. Again, that we are uh, at some precipice or some apex of superiority, and then we um then going back to the machine learning and the the silicon based is where we're creating uh, mirrors of ourselves that are going to be much more efficient at um, sort of propositional types of knowing or or other types of intelligence. And you know, do we do we have wisdom? Um, governor governance and regulation there built into that you know so so I just to me again I think given where we've arrived or where we are in an evolutionary or adaptation scenario um, you know it just makes me wonder uh, if if we are pro-adaptive or maladaptive at this point if that makes sense you know like are we at a place of uh, demonstrating pro-adaptive uh, tendencies or or signifiers by way of our behavior, by way of our, um, the way we express ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, by pro-adaptive and maladaptive, do you mean in r relation to the survival of our own species? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like we're smart enough to be dangerous, right? And and not regulating, you know, we call ourselves the wise ape, um, but we have the means to destroy the planet millions of times over or thousands of times over with nuclear weapons. And so we built in this sort of uh, collective uh, suicidal um, tendency or predilection or whatever it is. And so again, mm -hmm. I'm trying not to be political or social in a sense. I'm trying to keep it as objective as possible. But this is a frank reality. We have weapons aimed at ourselves that will just, you know, probably knock out most of life. And uh, mm -hmm. and so, you know, that speaks to the be the cost end of this really sharp intelligence that we have. This really um, intense means of calculating and predicting and modeling and all these kind of things so uh, if exactly. i'm going to if i'm going too far off the rails just bring me back in and we'll talk about something a little lighter but yeah it just speaks to to you know just having a frank uh perspective on you know here we are with this kind of intelligence and this kind of um systemization of that intelligence or or the functionality of that intelligence mm -hmm. i mean one could argue that perhaps we don't have enough foresight. I mean, yes, we have an advanced prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. but perhaps our maladaptive behavior is a result of not planning enough that if we had more foresight, then we could plan around things like climate change or have predicted that at the beginning of the industrial revolution and acted on it more quickly. Mm -hmm. So I, I also think about, and I don't have many answers, but I think about what does it mean to have advanced metacognition what does it mean what, what does it even mean to have a gulf between humans and more instinctual creatures because i don't know if it is a useful distinction to have extinct ex instinctual versus cognitive because 
I feel like it's all a form of computation, but with different layers of regulation. And maybe what we're calling metacognition might just be um, a bunch of instincts that are regulated and layered atop one another. So, um, and they're also, I think about type one and type two motivations, and I always forget which one is which, but mm. um, one of them is when humans are motivated by just basically what, what feels good. Um, mm. And then the other is motivated by a larger plan. And some sometimes these two things coincide, but um, in, in a sort of organic way. But I think there, there's always a push and pull. Um, they're always in a, I mean, in the human population, for example, there's a push or, or there's there are people who are very concerned about the environment and very concerned about climate change and altruism. And there are other people who are more short term and more interested in what can we do to enhance the survival of our species in this generation, like in for us now. And I think there's um, because of that push and pull, um, one of them is going to win out. I'm not quite sure which one, but well, it seems like capitalism has really taken over everything. And mm -hmm. and that that is the that's the second pull that is might bring about our destruction. But mm -hmm. as I talk to you during our pre-meet, I feel like there's something just vastly beyond our own species. And when we think about um, when we think about more dispersed intelligence, I think that doesn't necessarily need to be limited to a single species, that there, there can also be communication across species. In fact, and, and this is a tangent, but that is one of the things I love about studying stentor. And in general, I'm drawn to study, like when I was in India, I was studying the brains of pollinators. I feel this gives me an exciting opportunity to try to communicate with a creature that is completely different from me. And what what kinds of things does it respond to? What if if this is a phone call between me and the stentor? What kind of signal do I need to give for it um, that matches the appropriate receiver that the creature has? So I mean that's something that I really enjoy trying to figure out um, how to communicate with different creatures. But I also think that this applies way beyond the research lab and to life in general, that mm -hmm. I, I think of us as a vast network beyond the human species. And even if this one node dies out, this one node of the human species die out, there's still another vast network of thousands and millions of other species that will gladly take over that node and as they said in Jurassic Park, life finds a way. Yeah. <laughs> maybe this is a good, maybe you just said the right thing to go ahead and hit pause on this conversation and we can do a part two if you want to come back and we can we can continue or branch out into other other ideas. Um, and I and I agree going back to what you were said said in the beginning a moment ago was uh, you know, that there I don't think there's a hard and fast division between the instinctual creatures and us, you know, metacognitive. I just think it's a useful fiction that we can draw out to to explain our behavior, to explain what we do. And I think you're absolutely right. I think you get the nail on the head when you say that, you know, despite our being able to project ideas forward and think forward, we don't necessarily have the acumen or or the alignment or whatever it is to see um, the cascade that maybe we're creating now that. Uh, abstractly or, or theoretically is unfolding, uh, like you said, with, um, you know, the industrial uh, revolution and the massive dumping of hydrocarbon fuel emissions and stuff like that in, into the atmosphere and all these other things that, you know, that we do in the name of, uh, like the utilitarian kind of like progress, pleasure, um, you know, seeking uh, a good life, all that kind of thing. Uh, but again, uh, you know, having to pass the cost on uh, into the future and to uh, future generations. So, so that's uh, there was a way to dial things in. I'd say maybe that's something, as our teachers used to say, needs attention or needs. You know, or at least I got those notices a lot as a kid. You know, it's like needs uh, <laughs> work. You know, so anyway, uh, but yeah, if you want to hit pause here, and like I said, you are more than welcome to come back if this was a good experience for you, and we can kind of, uh, I'll come up with some new questions for you, and we can we can move the conversation forward or, or again, you know, branch into something else. But um, yeah, if you want to uh, go ahead and pause here, we can do that. So that sounds good sure. to you. Yeah, okay. that sounds great.
Thanks so I'm, much for Oh yeah, I'm so grateful to you for coming on. And again, I'm I'm sort of classic general audience guy, you know, lay person and curious. And so you've been able to just really unpack a lot of things and and share a lot of information, your wisdom and and uh, what you've learned and what you're going to continue to learn. And so um yeah, let's check back in with you. And um do you have a parting thought or something you want to convey that maybe didn't get addressed for this segment or any last words or thoughts <laughs> before we before we uh, conclude? Um, I guess two final thoughts. Okay. Um, one is reemphasizing the point that I think there are so many discoveries left to be made in local ponds because it's not really feasible for the limited number of center scientists in the world to go sampling from every pond. So actually, I think some of the best scientists are um, not formally trained per se, and also are sometimes children. I mean, one thing that is really important to me and the lab and Wallace Marshall's philosophy in general is um, getting other people involved in science and we have a program called Stenter in every school, and we we've started bringing Stenter into elementary school um, school classrooms and teaching kids about what cells are and how to interact with cells, where they can find cells. And a lot of these kids had great ideas for how to experiment with them, and we encourage them to go find them in the wild as well in their own local ponds and backyards. So, if anyone's out there watching this and wants to be a scientist. I think the only requirement for being a scientist is to be curious and pursue that curiosity. Mm -hmm. And Stenter are a great vehicle for doing that. And I guess the second thing is that maybe I, I'll end with is I feel like the greatest, one of the greatest joys about doing science is the feeling of being small. And I get that feeling of smallness, like from the, the awe that nature inspires. And Stenter are particularly um, amenable to that because I, I mentioned earlier that I think of myself as this Russian nesting doll of computation all the way down. And so if if you're watching this and having a bad day, I, I hope you think about all of the little creatures inside of you that are doing amazing computation that make it so that you're alive, because that's sometimes what I think about when I have a bad day. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good existential uh, support <laughs> you know, to, to help us realize that. And, and you know, one of my takeaways from what we're talking about, the nested computation, scale invariant uh, intelligence, as, as Mike, Dr. Mike Levin says, is it gives me a sense of humility, too. And, and humility for me is grounding in that my sense of self-importance, I don't know if I try or if I feel it fleeting, uh, you know, however that's working out, that the more I try to tap into what the work you're doing and others are doing um, really can downplay um, what priorities are, at least for me. And, and, and I don't want to say that in like a false sense of, you know, like, look at me, I'm, I'm special by pretending to be modest or whatever. It's more that it's just really it is humbling to see your 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 place, your role, and you step outside of the kind of pursuits that we get into as people and human beings, and and just look around and and see what's in the pond, or you know what your neighbor is doing, or as you said, you know, with other cultures that are more um, uh, so pro social or or socially oriented, uh, you know, looking out for themselves as well as others. And so that's what I'm taking away from the work you do and, and the work that others are doing. So I agree uh, that, you know, um, life can seem, seem challenging and, and uh, difficult, but, uh, you know, you're not going it alone. There are millions of other, myriad other experiential agents that are uh, endeavoring to not only survive, but thrive. And so <laughs> maybe that'll be my concluding statement. <laughs> and, uh, I want to thank you again, not just for being my guest and being in conversation with me, but for what is going to then be delivered to the world in this uh, YouTube 
conversation and that the continuance of your work, uh, I know, is going to yield uh, pearls uh, for the world and for uh, the community at large. So I will thank you for now and I will thank you <laughs> for, for that which goes into the future. And again, if you had a good experience, I definitely want to have you back. We can uh, do some more thinking, some more flowing, uh, some more ideas, speculation, whatever you want to call it. So, um, but yes, thank you so much. And to the YouTube audience, thank you all so very much. And Deep, I'll say goodbye to you after we're done with record. But thank you, uh, YouTube audience. I hope this was a, a an enjoyable conversation and informative one too. So, all right, let me let me hit the stop here. Bye bye, everyone.